absolutely delighted and honored to be here today with Ben Steele, who is one of the smartest economic historians I know. But before I kick off ask, interviewing him, I want to quickly get a sense of where you guys are. Hands up anyone who's actually read The Battle of Bretton Woods. Okay, that wasn't your homework assignment, but okay. Um, how many of you have done economics courses? Okay, great, all right. So that is your level of geekiness, okay? <laughs> Be nice to them. Um, well, as you've just heard, Ben, Dr. Steele, has written the definitive book of why we are here today. It's a really good read. I mean, any of you who haven't read it and kind of don't much like economics or find history boring or get put off by several hundred pages worth of text, it's actually a really fun read. It's beautifully written. Um, in fact, it's such a great read that back in 2013 when it came out, it was named as the favorite book of business people that year by Bloomberg and by a number of other publications. But I'd like to start off by asking you, here we are in this historic place at this historic moment. Why did you write this book? I decided um, to consider writing the book back in 2009 as the financial crisis was spreading globally. And you had all these world leaders from um, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown to French Prime Minister um, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, all calling for, quote unquote, a new Bretton Woods. And I was struck by the fact that I had never seen anything written about the old original Bretton Woods. There had been tons of really boring technical tracks written on the so-called Bretton Woods system, the system that emerged at Bretton Woods and the institutions that emerged at Bretton Woods, but nothing that had been written about the episode. Now, uh, I was trained as a financial economist, not as an uh, historian, and we financial economists are taught that if you see $20 on the ground, you are insane. Because, of course, if there were $20 on the, the ground, it would have been picked up by now. So as a financial economist, I should have said, well, if there's anything interesting to be said about Bretton Woods, it would have been said by now. But this was truly $20 and more laying there on the ground. It, it, it turned out to be a far more fascinating story than I could have imagined. Right. Well, and I should have quickly asked, by the way, so did they actually meet? It actually took place in this hotel, did in, it? In this hotel, yes. Right, so you're literally sitting surrounded by the ghosts of history. Okay, you decided to write this book because you thought basically no one else had done it, which is always a good reason to do something. <laughs> And many people would say, before you started writing this book, you must have written it as some kind of great celebration of globalization and coordination and kind of international economic kumbaya, because that's how it's usually presented. In fact, we just heard that at the end of the conference, they actually gave a speech celebrating the end of economic ills or evils. And of yet... Of course, is exactly what happened. Well, before we start about what happened after the Bretton Woods Agreement, I want to go back a bit, because anyone who's read the book will know that the idea that they came together in some great kumbaya moment is actually, to use not too technical a term, total bollocks. <laughs> Tell us what actually happened, why they came. Was it actually about coordination and, and international harmony? This was not a gathering like ours. Um, where people of goodwill, of different views, come together and try to hash out a, at least a common understanding of, of where the world is and what we need to do to, to fix it. To put it simply, that common understanding had been established for them in advance. Um, as the head of the British delegation, the famous economist John Maynard Keynes had um, famously put it when describing the non-Anglo-Saxon elements of the conference. There were 44 nations represented there. Um, he referred to them as the monkey house. What Keynes was trying to um, uh, express was his disdain for the non-Anglo-Saxon world, that they didn't deserve to have an opinion because they simply weren't relevant. What Keynes failed to understand was that his American counterpart, 
um, Harry Dexter White, who's one of the most fascinating political figures of the 20th century that nobody knows anything about, considered Keynes to be nothing more than a member of the monkey house. Um, so let's roll back for a moment, okay? So what actually, why did Bretton Woods even happen? Right. Because, you know, you have these two towering figures from the UK, John Maynard Keynes, brilliant economist, I hope you've all studied him, and Harry Dexter White, who was from the US Treasury. Right. But whose idea was it even to get together? Well, um, as Olivia emphasized, um, ideas really matter. People really matter. These are not just historical forces at work. Um, uh, FDR actually had absolutely no interest in international monetary coordination. He destroyed the so-called London economics in 1933 by referring to exchange rate coordination among nations as being a quote-unquote fetish of international bankers. But this, this one man, Harry Dexter White, who was um, a, a, an unknown middling treasury official who came to Washington in 1934 as a sort of bureaucratic temp. He was being paid out of the profits of the Exchange Stabilization Fund because he wasn't even an official civil servant. What I found in his archives is he had started planning for an international conference like this at least as far back as 1936. I found these long memos that he wrote to himself, um, which he sh shared with no one. And he had two primary motivations for wanting to produce this conference. And one was genuinely international. Um, and that was that White believed that um, the political strife that was developing in, in the world fundamentally had economic causes. That the breakdown in international economic um, cooperation in the early 1930s, in particular the so-called currency and trade wars of the early 1930s when Britain entered the gold exchange standard and dozens of countries followed after that, and then countries started imposing tariffs on each other. Um, this what was leading the path to war, and so we needed a, a new set of institutions and mechanisms to promote international cooperation and prevent its breakdown. But he also had a very nationalist uh, uh, agenda, which was unstated, but at least as important. Because until this point, or until a little while before this, sterling had, of course, been the dominant currency in the world. Yes. And then you go into the World War I, and then World War II, and, of course, America's becoming much more powerful. And so Henry Dexter Waite actually basically said, right, if America's becoming powerful, the dollar should be dominant. That's right. And in 1936, he's already writing these memos to him, him, himself, um, explaining what he's going to have to do to best the British Empire at this conference that he's planning. And he laments that the more, quote unquote, sterling countries there are in the world, the more countries that use the pound sterling or peg their currency to the pound sterling, the more power Britain will have around a conference table. And so he's already planning, how do we whittle down that power before a conference takes place? Fast forward to the early 1940s, and we stumble upon our answer, because Britain is rapidly going bankrupt in order to prosecute the um, uh, uh, world war in Europe uh, and in Asia. And White, in particular, seizes the opportunity to impose American conditions on the financial aid provided to Britain to get through the war. And there are three of them in particular that are highly relevant to Bretton Woods. One is that he wants to weaken the so-called economic glue of the British Empire. Um, he says that Britain has to end so-called imperial preference. This is the arrangement by which Britain arrogated it to itself, um, privileged access to the markets of its colonies and dominions. This is anathema to America, both from a political perspective, considering itself to be the great anti-colonial power in the world, and from a commercial perspective, because it's bad for our companies. Second, he wants the pound sterling to once again be made fully convertible particularly at an overvalued um, exchange rate. So the colonies and dominions will rush to London and cash in their worthless sterling for US dollars. And third, and this was certainly the, the most 
important issue for him at Bretton Woods where he used remarkable ruses. It's almost astounding that he managed to get away with it in order to th enthrone the dollar as the, the new global currency, the new gold for all intents and purposes. And right. Keynes and White had ferocious battles for two years in the run-up to Bretton Woods. In the middle of World War II. In the middle of World War II. Keynes fully understood the game that White was playing, um, but Keynes wanted to keep playing it because he wanted to be known as the man who overthrew the wretched gold standard. So under the guise of talking about international cooperation and harmony and kumbaya, in fact, this was actually a massive American power grab. It was. Um, it, okay. It was. It, it wasn't. It I wasn't say that with a British accent. He has the American <laughs> accent. I have the British accent. So you can guess where we're coming from. That I no should, hard feelings. I should emphasize that not not everything that America does in its national uh, interest is terrible for the world. And of I, course not. <laughs> no comment. I, I However, do. let us let us ascertain, okay? The Bretton Woods, I'm going to talk about the post-Bretton Woods um, experience in a moment, but let us ascertain that Bretton Woods was actually driven partly by international cooperation, partly by a massive American power grab, which, in a sense, Britain had to go along with because it was totally, totally in debt. Okay, we're going to come to some of the implications for US-China relations a bit later on. You may not be surprised to hear that Ben told me earlier his book has been a bestseller in China. Think about it. It sold more copies in Chinese than in English, which I found wrong. So what we're going to talk about next has a lot of implications looking forward to. Anyway, that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> Why on earth did John Maynard Keynes actually go along with any of this? Because, you know, he thought he was the smartest man on the planet. Why on earth didn't he stop this? He tried. Um, but uh, first of all, he was an utterly appalling diplomat. I mean, he was an absolutely brilliant man. But when you're a diplomat and you want to convince someone who's more powerful than, than you, more, um, uh, or um, wealthier, than you, on whom you depend for your survival, it's probably not a good strategy to in, insult them. And he was constantly um, insulting his American interlocutors, their, his, their his in, creditors. intelligence. Yeah, for example, um, the Fed chairman, Mariner Eccles, um, who happened to be a, a, a Mormon. Cain spit out one day, no wonder that man is a Mormon. No single woman could tolerate him. <laughs> uh, now, <laughs> and bear in mind, remember that he was the one who owed money to the Americans. <laughs> the Americans, for example, if I can tell one more uh, anecdote, when they were discussing the possibility of a post-war loan to Britain, at one point an American official said, well, maybe things aren't as bleak as you, you paint them in, in, in Britain. You say you're short of gold, but I didn't... Things can happen. Maybe you'll find gold in a cave. And Keynes leaned forward and said, Frank, write that down. We accept that. Gold in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> if it happens, sure. Um, so Keynes um, had, was not only a poor diplomat, but he really had, a, he had one attribute that a diplomat should never have in a discussion like this, and that he had a personal stake in the outcome. Uh, he knew that it would be white system and not his that would go through Bretton Woods, but he was quite convinced that the world would ultimately see, see sense and adopt his system and that he would therefore be the, um, uh, the person who was ultimately recognized as producing the, the new international monetary system. But Keynes had fierce critics within the um, uh, British government. One top treasury official um, named uh, Otto Clark, for example, was, was scathing about Keynes um, going forward with Bretton Woods. He said, we the British don't need this. 
What we need to do is to survive the war. We don't need to borrow this money from the US Treasury with this, these wretched geopolitical conditions. We can borrow the money from the Canadians. We can borrow from the American Export Import Bank, which doesn't have this agenda. We could borrow the money privately. And indeed, one of the things I found in the course of the research that surprised me is that US bankers were very much against Bret Woods because they considered the IMF to be a competitor for their own international lending. Business. So right before the conference in May of 44, uh, a group of um, British uh, representatives met with a group of top-level British ba uh, American bankers in New York and were offered a loan of up to $5 billion on concessionary terms, which was an extraordinary amount of money at the time, over $50 billion, if the British would walk away from the Bretton Woods Conference. And they were tempted by it, but Keynes, who was head of the British delegation, would not hear of it. So basically you're saying that what happened was that Britain turned down a sensible option and played into the American hands because of male ego? <laughs> <laughs> Just randomly guessing? Toxic masculinity has always dominated, yes. Um, I, I think that's fair. Okay. <laughs> so as I say, this isn't quite your normal vision of Bretton Woods. It's going to get even stranger in a moment. But anyway, so after all this, after three weeks of discussions, the last two weeks were absolutely, sorry, last two days were absolutely mayhem. frenzied, yeah. mayhem, cliffhanger, because everyone can see what kind of dirty agenda was being packaged up as Kumbaya. They finally signed the deal. Of course, Keynes then goes back and has a lot of criticism back in the UK, unsurprisingly, but the deal is signed. And then the war ends. And that's kind of one myth exploded about Kumbaya to start off with. But the other myth that is very interesting is that people often think that they've signed the Bretton Woods Agreement and suddenly, up from nowhere, up pops the IMF and World Bank and a whole series of fixed exchange rates and suddenly we have this wonderful orderly world where kind of everyone agrees to cooperate, although on American terms. What actually happened after the Bretton Woods Agreement was signed? And why is that vision wrong? Basically, the, the vision, I, ha I have to emphasize, was a complete and utter failure. The IMF and the World Bank were pretty much moribund, not just throughout the rest of the 40, 40s, but throughout the um, 1950s. The monetary system that was designed at Bretton Woods, I would argue, didn't really start until um, roughly 1961. It wasn't until 1961 that the first nine European countries met the currency convertibility requirements of the IMF uh, Articles of Agreement. And by that time, the system was already breaking down because the United States, which had promised to back it, the US dollar, which is now going to be the global currency, with gold at $35 an ounce, was rapidly losing gold reserves as countries, led in particular by France, were losing confidence in the uh, American ability to keep this pledge and were demanding their um, gold back. Um, so this actually led to um, my more recent book, The Marshall Plan, which was a, a response, really, to the failure of Bretton Woods, both as a political initiative and as an economic uh, initiative. So most of the role that the FDR administration had imagined the IMF and the World Bank playing in reviving the global economy was in fact taken over by the Marshall Plan. So basically it was a bit of a marketing con. It, I it, mean after, you know, because one of the things I find fascinating was, you know, it's actually 25 years after Dexter White first had this idea of Bretton Woods right. until it actually began to even vaguely happen. And by the time it actually began to happen, it wasn't really quite how he imagined it at all. No, but he had a very, shall we say, active imagination. And as you know from having read the book, he also had an alternative vision of the... Of the well, future. one of the other things about fascinating about this you know, vision of the history, which I imagine most of you in the room may know or may not, was that he, Dexter White actually had a kind of hidden life, didn't he? He was out there championing for American interests, essentially succeeding in imposing an American vision 
on the world, the economic system. And yet he wasn't just working for America at all, was he? No, and this was the part of the story that I wasn't prepared for when I started the research. So let me just give you one question that sounds boring and technical that actually opens up into an, an entirely unforeseen world of political history. Why is it that the um, International Monetary Fund has always been run by a European and the World Bank by an American? when the IMF was vastly more important to the Americans than the World Bank. In fact, Harry Dexter White made sure that he would run the commission to create the IMF and the new global monetary system and shunted Keynes off to the commission to create the World Bank because he didn't give a damn about it. So how did this come about? And this is what I discovered. In January of 1946, President Truman nominates Harry Dexter White to be the first US executive director of the fund and is going to nominate him to be the first managing director of the fund, the head of the fund. Um, but when J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, gets wind of this, he prepares a long memo for the president arguing that he should not even consider it because he, Hoover, can prove that Harry Dexter White is in fact a Soviet agent. Now, President Truman doesn't trust Hoover, doesn't believe Hoover, but now knows that he has an enormous political problem on his hands because if he goes forward with the nomination, Hoover is going to leak this and it's going to create a political scandal. Um, his Treasury Secretary and his Secretary of State want White out of government. They never liked the man. They never trusted the man. Um, but uh, Truman, who's a political operator, um, figures that's too drastic. I can quarantine him as US executive director and nobody will know about this problem. But now they have a political problem about who to appoint US uh, um, uh, managing director of the fund because if they choose somebody other than white, it's going to provoke questions about why the architect of the fund was overlooked. And Truman didn't want to answer those questions. So in March of 46, just before the Savannah Conference to um, inaugurate the IMF, uh, the US Treasury Secretary met with Keynes and told him that after due consideration, um, the administration had decided that to secure the confidence of the American financial community, um, uh, they had decided that they wanted presidency of the World Bank and it would be ungracious of the United States to take both institutions, which, by the way, were domiciled in Washington. So the Americans were nothing <laughs> like gracious throughout this episode. Keynes was shocked. So um, uh, he couldn't understand why, why this was, was, was being done, and the American explanation really made no sense. But there it was. Um, Truman was trying to cover up a spy scandal by handing the IMF over to the um, Europeans. So now, just when you thought it couldn't get any more bizarre, <laughs> the man who tried to take over the global financial system, who took over the global financial system on behalf of the Americans, was actually a Russian spy. Now, Hoover, at times, could be rather overzealous when pursuing communists. But in this case, he, didn't, <laughs> he did not know a fraction of it. Um, under the Freedom of Information Act, um, I got the FBI to give me 13,000 pages on Harry Dexter White. Included in this 13,000 pages were 18 Soviet intelligence cables that were intercepted and decrypted by the United States during and after World War II, in some cases decades after World War II, but only declassified in the late 1990s. And 18 of those cables mention Harry Dexter White by his various code names referring to his activity on behalf of the Soviet Union. Now, I don't want to dominate the discussion with peripheral matters about what he was um, doing. He was a political romantic, um, very much um, left of the mainstream uh, center at the time. But the people ask me, well, but does that mean that the Bretton Woods framework is some sort of communist trick? And the answer is no. And this is because even though White was very solicitous of the Soviet um, delegation at Bretton Woods, in fact, he infuriated the Europeans with the concessions he was making to them, there is no such thing as Soviet monetary thinking. Because this 
Soviets have a state-controlled economy. I know. The, I did my PhD in the Soviet <laughs> Union. <laughs> no, the <seriously>. Soviets <laughs> were at Bretton Woods for one reason, uh, to, two reasons. First, to get um, credits from the United States. And second, they loved the idea of a new international monetary system being refounded on gold because the Soviets had a lot of it. Um, so they weren't planning to participate in it, but they certainly wanted to boost global demand for gold. So if nothing else, this shows that economic history is not boring. <laughs> and it also shows that, you know, out of these very dirty, messy, mixed motives, where frankly everything is a hall of mirrors and nothing is what it seems to be or is presented today, actually a system emerged which kind of wasn't that bad. I mean, when you look at back at what actually came out of this very dirty, tangled tale, do you think Bretton Woods worked? It, certainly the monetary system didn't, didn't work. It didn't work as it, as it, was, um, as it was, was planned. There were fundamental flaws in it, so-called Triffin dilemma. I won't get into the technicalities of no, it. No, don't. Um, this was this was not this was not your great great grandfather's gold standard. This was not the gl classical gold standard of the 19th century when we had the first wave of globalization. This was a bastardized version of it. Having said that, we did create some institutions like the IMF and the World Bank that continue on today. Um, I think we'd all agree that they have flaws, but my my personal view, I, I think you share it, is that we're better off with a world in which these institutions play an active role than a world in which we have no multilateral forums for um, uh, discussion and cooperation. Um, you know, just to throw in one example, um, China's uh, Belt and Road uh, 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 initiative, you don't have anywhere near the sort of um, holistic conditionality related to, for example, environmental protection mm -hmm. on lending um, uh, that you do when it's um, conducted through the, the World Bank. And so these institutions have um, adapted themselves very considerably. In fact, I mean, Kay Keynes and White would not recognize, in particular, the IMF that we um, have uh, today. today. But I, I, I do believe that we're better off with those institutions than when But that brings me to the present, because I was in Paris um, at last week, um, which was a lot hotter. Not quite as beautiful, but a lot hotter. And there was a meeting of the G7 central bank governors and finance ministers. And there was a long discussion about where we are now with Bretton Woods. And the thing that was stunning about that was that most of the people who are essentially the key pillars of the system, they're upholding the system, if you like, they're the Vaticans, or the, sorry, the cardinals of the Vatican of economics. Most of them think that the system is to some degree now in crisis. It's partly because the world is awash with money and they don't understand how inflation works anymore. It's partly because no one seems to think it's a great idea to even try and control currencies. But it's also because, ironically, the country which first gave us Bretton Woods, America, now appears keen to walk away from it. It's remarkable to consider that all of the institutions that we associate with the post-war liberal order today were created by the United States in just a few short years after World War II. Um, the United <coughs> Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, the predecessor organizations to both the EU and the WTO, despite what the president says about the EU having been created to screw the US on trade, it was a creation of the State Department. It was in integral to the Marshall Plan. All these things, um, all these institutions are now being questioned by their primary creator, the United States, which is something, I don't know about you, I certainly didn't anticipate before um, 2016, and I think that's the, the most fundamental reason why they're in crisis. 
And of course, on top of that, we have the very tangled and tortured relationship between the US and China. Explain to everyone in the room why the Chinese are so obsessively interested in this history now. Yeah, um, the Chinese love the Bretton Woods story because they see themselves as the Americans of the 1940s and they see us in the United States as the British of the 1940s, the declining, decrepit ex-imperial power. With a um, bit of male ego. Yeah. <laughs> so this story to them is a story about where they will be in the current years dominating the economic and financial architecture. And of course these days it's America which is in debt, not the UK which is in debt. But that, that parallel can be um, uh, overplayed. Um, so for example, how did, the, how did the US use Britain's debt to its uh, advantage? Um, the Suez Crisis in 56, um, the Eisenhower administration withheld emergency IMF support for Britain, um, which would have provoked a sterling crisis, and, but the United States could afford to do that at no cost to itself because American holdings of British securities were trivial amounting to about $1 per US resident. Now fast forward to today. Let us say that China somehow wanted to precipitate a dollar crisis in order to punish us. Now China's holdings of dollar denominated securities are enormous, amounting to more than $1,000 per Chinese resident. So at least in the short term, any efforts that China might undertake to uh, punish us through an international financial crisis, a dollar crisis, would hurt them at least as much, I would argue more, certainly in the short term, than it would, would hurt us. So the parallels can be overdrawn. But do you think, I'm gonna to turn to the audience for questions in just a moment, but I have two last questions. Firstly, do you think there's any chance that the Chinese might try to do a replay of the Bretton Woods Conference or have some big meeting or call something like this over in China? Well, look, Harry Dexter White didn't call the conference until he knew that he would dominate it. And the reason he knew that he would dominate it was that there was a deal to be done. Britain was bankrupt, Britain was desperate, Britain had to do a deal. So you had the two major financial powers in the, in the world ready to do a deal. Now it was on very unequal terms, but it was a deal nonetheless. China's not going to call a conference like that knowing that the, the US has, is not in that position, has no incentive uh, to play ball. Um, right now, in terms of, so the evolution of monetary system, we're at a complete stalemate between China and the United States. Um, uh, both of them, for better or for worse, prefer to continue muddling through rather than trying to change the system because there is simply no, no basis for agreement on what a new system would look like. The Chinese central bank governor, Zhou Xiaochuan, 10 years ago, back in 2009, produced this remarkable, very provocative um, statement suggesting that Bretton Woods had been a terrible mistake and that we shouldn't have followed the white plan. We should have, produced, we should have um, uh, adopted the Keynes plan for a new supranational currency that would have, he, um, Keynes hoped, replace like Bancor. The, the dollar. Yeah. Bancor. Thus the, thus the um, name. But can anyone imagine China actually be, um, being willing to subordinate its monetary sovereignty to the demands of a new supranational currency? I certainly can't. So I think that was more a rhetorical slap at the United States than it was a serious proposal to change the system. So that brings me to my other question before I turn to any of you for questions, which is, how did digital currencies change this? Could Libra be a new quasi-bankor? Could something coming out of Alipay or Tencent or 
you know, is uh, our digital currency is going to provide in any way, shape, or form the disruptive element that breaks a stalemate and perhaps starts a whole new conversation with maybe dirty motives mm -hmm. all over again, but perhaps a chance to reset. Uh, I, we have to take it seriously. I personally was rather taken aback with um, um, uh, Chairman Powell's uh, comments last week on Libra, which were showed, demonstrated more concern than I expected him to express um, uh, publicly, saying that there was a lot to investigate here. So yeah, I think he was making clear that this is a, not an initiative that's going to go forward without very significant input from the, the various arms of the US government, and for good reason. I mean, if Facebook should go forward with creating its own currency, Facebook has, what, 2.5 billion users? So this yeah, would effectively more, yes. be creating a new monetary collective, almost the size of China and India put together overnight. Um, and that, that, is a, that, I do believe, could pose a fundamental challenge to what we have viewed to date as being the prerogatives of monetary sovereignty, of state sovereignty in the monetary sphere. Well, being a bit cynical on the basis of the conversations last week in Paris, I think that actually, you know, the issue at stake is what a stable coin would be tied to. And if it's tied to a US dollar and under the control of the Fed, then actually it suddenly might become a bit more acceptable because you're de facto having dollarization of the world. But that's just my own cynical thought. Um, anyway, any questions? Shall we start with Professor Summers? Ben, thank you. Uh, it's rare when somebody's written a terrific book and you've read it, and then you hear them talk about it to learn more than you'd learned from your book. So thank you for that uh, splendid uh, presentation. You said one thing that at one level I understood, but at another level, my experience makes me wonder. I knew that was coming. <laughs> you, yeah, and I'm not always polite, as you know, Jillian. Um, as you, you spoke in an extremely approving way of uh, the conditionality imposed by the international institutions as an alternative to what you saw as the craven compliance with environmental disregard that was the practice of China and Belt and Road. Um, I remember a conversation I had with the president of a Latin American country, and this Latin America, if any country in Latin America would be regarded as clearly democratic, it would be uh, this one. And he said, and it made a big impression on me, and it's something I think people here ought to think about. He said, you know, it's as easy to form an NGO as it is to form a brass plate bank. And here in our de democratic country, we like to think that we will decide whether we want to fund a certain kind of project, and there are a lot of trade-offs involved in dam building dams, for example, and we want to make them. And we don't understand why you, through the World Bank, impose a set of requirements for special approvals and special analyses and popular participation and 93 different kinds of checking with um, NGOs before we can build a dam that no mayor in the United States would ever accept from the federal government and that absolutely go a million miles beyond anything that would be done in the United States or in Western uh, Europe. And so we sort of think that there shouldn't be nearly this elaborate conditionality and that it's really subverting our democracy for you to decide which stakeholders in our country are going to be empowered with respect to a variety of these decisions. Wasn't he kind of right? Your, your point is, is historically imp 
uh, impeccable, Larry. If you um, go back to 1945 and the debate in Congress about whether to approve Bretton Woods, you had in particular Republican uh, congressmen um, grilling Harry Dexter White. Why would we allow these monkey houses around the world to intervene in the way we operate our monetary and financial affairs here in the United States. I mean, this is totally unacceptable. And Harry Dexter White loved this question. He said, well, he said, the way we um, uh, established the voting rights at Bretton Woods, one nation and one nation only has veto power and that is the United States. So if you, congressman, should ever get a report written by all the other member states saying that the United States should stop doing X and start doing Y, he said, you can give it all due consideration and then throw it in the bin. Now, no other nation would be able to do that. And the perspective from the United States is, well, if you don't like it, don't come to the World Bank. Don't come to the IMF. This is our gift to humanity. If you want to partake in it, you are welcome to, but you do it on our terms. Now, I'm obviously exaggerating being somewhat um, uh, facetious, but the, the, the idea was that these institutions would be dominated by technocrats that had the best interest of mankind at heart. And they would be over, able to overcome the governance problems that would produce, for example, corruption in um, large infrastructure problems or produce massive environmental damage in um, uh, rural areas. And that we in the United States, of course, don't need that protection from foreign technocrats because we are able to, to govern ourselves. So there was a, a sort of uh, paternalism um, uh, involved. It is remarkable today, and I think you at least share this perspective with me, that you have Republican congressmen questioning whether we should do governance reform at the IMF and the World Bank when no one is challenging our veto. I mean, if we were to try to create institutions like this today, remember, after World War II, we, we uh, accounted for more than half the world's GDP. Today, it's less than a quarter. Can anybody the, um, imagine the United States proposing to the world with a straight face that we should be the only country having a veto? Um, yet the world is still willing to play by these rules. We should be leaping at the opportunity to pursue reforms that at the margin give more voice to China, bringing them into the multilateral institutions that we created and in which we have predominant um, control, and giving countries less incentive um, uh, to turn to China as an alternative to these institutions. Of course, what's actually happening is that the system as, as it currently stands is giving every incentive to China to create its own rival institutions um, in a, with consequences that are yet to be seen. Okay, a question here and then back there. I just want to go back to Russia. <laughs> um, just in terms of your perspective on, okay, so China and the US are kind of a stalwart, stalemate, whatever that word is. Um, and so even with this like historical narrative of Russia kind of having this, you know, uh, spy uh, kind of uh, uh, perspective on wanting to be involved, um, you know, quietly, like what is your perspective now on where Russia would stand with these two superpowers kind of, you know, at odds or at least at a stalwart and then Russia, what? What do you think is happening there is basically what well, I'm asking. There's, 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 no, there's no doubt that there is more of a confluence of interest between China and Russia than there ever was in the 1940s. Indeed, the two countries were, were massively at, at, at odds. Um, in 1945, of course, 
Russia invaded Manchuria um, at the very end of uh, uh, the war and extracted massive concessions from the Chinese in order to evacuate its troops. So the, the, but um, fast forward to today, and um, uh, President Putin has made very clear that one of his aims is to reduce the um, dominance globally of the US dollar. And this is a very powerful um, geoeconomic tool of the United States that we are able to sanction countries by um, preventing them from participating in international transactions because of the unique role of the US dollar. So Russia is one of the major countries in the world trying to develop and exploit alternative architectures in order to get around the use of um, the US dollar. Of course, North Korea couldn't survive without mechanisms to get around the use of the US dollar. North Korea, for example, is um, one of the um, great state hackers of Bitcoin, particularly in their uh, southern neighbor, um, uh, South Korea. Um, the Europeans, um, uh, in response to the United States um, uh, leaving the uh, Iran um, uh, uh, accord, trying to maintain Iran within the accord, are trying to build a new architecture, a payment system that will uh, 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 extract the US dollar from these transactions. Um, I think the lesson for us here in, that, in the United States is that um, these types of financial sanctions are like a very powerful antibiotic, which can be very useful when we target it at um, an important specific problem. But if we overuse it, um, the bacteria that we're going after develop resistance and you wind up with strains of the disease that we are not able to deal with um, uh, at all. And there's a question back there. Uh, hi, my name is Jonah. I organize a global network of philanthropists and innovators called Nexus. Uh, I have a question related to Libra. So if the success of Bitcoin suggests that it actually may be possible to decouple a currency from a government, then Maybe it's just a matter of time until there are many prevalent cryptocurrencies in use. Cryptocurrencies are not just uh, issuers of currency, they're also payment networks. And in a search for legitimacy, Facebook relinquished itself from 100% control of Libra and created this system, the Libra Association, to have 100 validator nodes of which 27 spots are filled and the other you know, 70 something are not. They're, they're, they want a democratic system. This, is, this to me, some people might call this a power grab, but to me, it's an invitation for global civil society to get involved and to demand a transaction fee that pays for the carbon economy. It's an opportunity to fill in the accountability gap, which is our current dysfunctional global governance system. The United Nations right. is n not really a democracy. That accountability gap allows the tragedy of the commons to advance. So speak to that for a moment. What's the opportunity for this room, for all the people in this room to unite as a force and to occupy Facebook Libra and, and other things like that and to demand a globally environmentally responsible economy? Um, before I wrote The Battle of Bretton Woods, I wrote a book called Money, Markets, and Sovereignty, which was a sort of big thing book about the history of money and it's a very uncomfortable relationship with the, con uh, the concept of national sovereignty. And what I found was that when you go back through history, there's this endless dialectic of money being created privately, then taken over either by the state or by actors who become the state by dint of having been able to take over the um, uh, currency. But um, monies were originally created privately as a means to facilitate uh, transactions. Um, they might have been oxen. They were obviously forms of metal like gold and, and, and silver. And then, of course, the temptation for states or um, um, uh, entrepreneurs of various sorts to take them over and utilize this power 
for example, to extract seniorage by in injecting base metals into the currency or to use it for taxation, et cetera, um, became overwhelming. When the state would take it over and it would corrupt the currency, the people would then look for alternatives. And so throughout history, you've seen this. And my view of not being an expert on cryptocurrency is that we may be entering in one of, into one of these new eras in which um, the private sphere is injecting its interests um, for good or for ill. Um, as you see, there's such a massive panoply of cryptocurrencies out there with very, very different foundations and, and motivations as you yourself have um, uh, emphasized. Now, I'm, I don't claim to know how it's going to play out, but I imagine, you know, fast forward 20, 20 years time, it's going to be a, a, a very different world than um, uh, it is today in terms of how we think of um, uh, monetary sovereignty. Well, sadly, very, very sadly, we are out of time. I think it's been a fascinating conversation. I mean, I take away three key points. One is that sometimes very bad motives can produce good things, and good motives can sometimes turn bad. And I think it's worth remembering that as we look to the future. Secondly, the system that did come out of the Bretton Woods Conference, which was in some ways a hall of mirrors, but that did come out, is increasingly frayed. Um, I think it's extremely unlikely that what we call the Bretton Woods system is going to last for another 75 years. We are at a very interesting flexion point, and even the people who are supposed to be upholding it seem to recognize that it probably will not last for another 75 years in this form. And I guess lastly, it is extremely unclear what is going to replace it. So therein both lies the tremendous challenge, but I would think that most of you would agree also a potential great opportunity. So you've got four days to figure it out. Good luck. <laughs>